Good morning and thank you for taking the time this morning to join our webinar, which over the next half an hour will look at on-farm animal breeding strategies to help improve both economic and environmental performance. Um, I'd ask you look to ensure that you send your questions to us as we go through, throughout the webinar and you can email them to hello at glanbeaconnect.com or alternatively you can text 086 1803947. I think intuitively we all know and I'm sure our vet here in Glanby Ireland Yara Summers will confirm that a healthy animal is generally a happy animal in that they have a longer lifespan in the herd, lower somatic cell count uh, for example. But in this webinar we're also going to explore with ICBF Chief Executive Sean Coughlin when this a good health strategy, herd health strategy is combined with a good breeding strategy this can deliver both improved on-farm economic and environmental performance. This matters to many of you viewing this webinar because this improved economic performance will act as a source and a catalyst for the investment required to continue to improve the environmental performance of our family farm businesses. We're all part of a journey here in Glanby, Ireland to reduce the footprint associated with each litre of milk we produce by 30% by 2030 as part of our company-wide sustainability strategy called Living Proof. And we know from the Chagas MAC or climate plan that breeding and in, and in particular focus on EBI will significantly help this journey in reducing our carbon footprint. So now it's time to hear from our speakers on the webinar today. Uh, and first up is Sean Coughlin, Chief Executive of ICBF. So Sean, we look forward to your presentation for the next couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you much, very much uh, Thomas, uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, hope everybody is, is doing well. So, um, folks, just for the next few minutes, I'm just going to take us on a, on, a, on across a few slides and just to, to cover a few areas. Um, firstly, focusing maybe a little bit on on the carbon footprint and 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 how we've been getting on there, and maybe then focus on a, on a couple of further items in terms of how we might deal with the, with the gross emissions and a couple of tools that we might have there in our toolkit as, as we head forward. So next slide, please. So the, the this, despite the narrative uh, that might be out there, I mean, Glanbia suppliers have been making great progress over the years in terms of sustainability. We've been fortunate with the EBI that the EBI and our, our sustainability in terms of carbon footprint and, and carbon efficiency are closely aligned. I mean, over the last 15 years, we've made great progress in EBI, and you can see there on the graph over the last five years, that progress has continued. We've had a 20% improvement in carbon footprint over the, the, the life of the EBI. And the, the great thing about breeding is that it's cumulative and permanent in, in, in nature, in that the decisions that you make and the, the progress that you make this year is, is embedded in the, in the system and, and is there for, to be benefited for future generations. The, the other thing I think that is important um, is that on that sustainability journey, and it was referenced earlier in the video, without economic sustainability, there is going to be no environmental sustainability. And their EBI has delivered about 250 euros per, more profit per lactation since we launched the EBI. And that's worth about four cents a litre uh, for each of the of, of, of the suppliers in, in, in the Glanby uh, uh, supplier base. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I have here on the graph is just the, these are a few statistics that 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 are, are here on the graph and and you know with the with the the Glanbia supplier base broken out into quintiles based on their EBI from the bottom 20% the next 20% the middle 20% up and to the top 20% and there's a few things, I suppose, that I'd just like to draw out here before we, we get to the, some of the, the, the key nuggets. The first thing is that is that the, the, the participation in Herd Plus is vastly is up at 93% for the top 20% versus at 60% for the, the, the average. Um, likewise, in milk recording, there's double the number of herds in the top 20% participating versus in versus the average. Uh, Milk liters are, are higher in the in the in the top 20% as are the milk solids and the SEC performance is, is better. And one of the things I know Yoris is going to talk about there in a few minutes is, is in relation to fertility. The average six week calving rate uh, in the top 20% is 14% ahead of the average. So it's at 79%. And what does this all, all, all mean? Well, it means that the, the top 20% are 10% ahead on the carbon footprint already than the than than the average. So, so I suppose the question then is, well, we saw on the previous slide that we're making great progress. Two questions come to mind. How can we go faster? 
And secondly, then, is how can we actually get the average uh, herds to get them to where the top 20% of herds are? And look, there you can see on the slide, there's a few areas there that I, that I would strongly be suggesting. I mean, one is, is use of, of high EBI AI sires. Um, and using the AI versus, you know, that allows us to, to, to manage the risk by using a, a broad range of bulls, but we have to be using the highest EBI bulls available. Um, we need to be using genotyping to make sure that we're identifying, getting the most accurate evaluations that we can on, a, on our cows, and then making sure that we're using the, 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 the best cows to actually breed the next generation from. And then the third thing that I would say is, is for those in maybe that, that are, you know, looking to, to actually make a fast move uh, and bridge that gap from the average up to the top 20%, I would say seriously consider buying in some replacements from the top 20% of herds. There is some risk, of course, in terms of, 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 a, of a health risk, risk associated with it. But look, I, I strongly believe that that can be mitigated. And I think, look, it, all things considered, I think that can be a good option for people that maybe are at the average or maybe below the average if they want to make fast progress in terms of getting up there to that top 20%. The other two areas there that I might mention just is, is again, using the information that's in Herd Plus, using the EBI information and also milk recording. I mean, without knowing the, the actual individual milk recording, uh, milk performance information from your cows it's very hard to make informed decisions so there would be uh, there would be some of the areas that I would strongly suggest and uh, next slide please and the, one of the other things I think that there are is, is still some low-hanging fruit in terms of, of progress that we can make around our carbon intensity we still have around 30% uh, of our heifers calving outside the optimum 22 to 26 month range you know, and yours is going to talk in a little bit about some things around the heifer preparation, but I think this is one area that we can still make a lot of progress. There's no reason why we can't have a much higher percentage of our first calvers calving in on time, and that will mean then that, you know, that will definitely improve our carbon footprint per, per kilogram of milk solids that we, we, we're producing. Next slide, please. So I've spoken a little bit about carbon uh, intensity and the carbon footprint per kilogram of, of, of milk solids. The next thing I just did, two, two areas I'd just like to talk about in terms of, of areas that we can, you know, tools that we can use to reduce our gross emissions. The first one is the age at finishing. And we can see here over the years, the offspring from Glanbia herds for the dairy beef animals leaving those herds, the average age at finishing has been reducing significantly over the last 10 years. Um, and look, you know, from 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 some initial work that has been done, if we can get a one month earlier finishing at a national level, it's equivalent to the saving of of, of about a hundred thousand cows. And we have made great progress already. And look, these gains in earlier finishing have been achieved without any significant compromise on carcass weight. There are some indications, perhaps, that that. Um, that there are some some there's some pressure on in relation to carcass confirmation, and we're, we're we're working on that at the moment. And I think just one one important point to mention, um, because I think it does make some people nervous when we talk about earlier finishing. It's critical that we're ma we're achieving this earlier finishing without increased feed or fertilizer costs, because if we're using more feed or more fertilizer, that's uh, you know that that's that's going against the gains here that we're making on age at, at finishing. So that's one of the key tools that 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 will be there. The second one that I'd like to just mentioned that we're, we're, we have some research done on the beef side. Next slide, please. We've some research done on the beef side and, 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 and more park are making good progress on, on the dairy side and we're looking to, to make progress is breeding for lower methane animals. You know, we're working there with uh, on a Department of Agriculture funded green breed project with Chagas. To date, we have about a thousand animals with direct measurement of growth, dry matter intake and, and methane per day from Tully. What's clear is that the indexes are moving in the right direction. We're, we're getting uh, lower dry matter intake animals with better kill out percentages. And there is clear evidence of new genetic variation uh, of you know, between five and 10% above what we can predict from current biological models. Our goal is to have genomic predictions for uh, methane traits coming from the Tully data in 2022. And you know, we, you know, our progress in this area will depend on the number of, of, of records that we can gather and the level of genotyping that we have. I suppose just looking briefly at the graph there, I mean, on, on, on the screen, where we want to be is we can see that within a given uh, methane uh, range, there's a significant genetic variation and we want to be using those animals that are and identifying those animals that are in the bottom uh, level of those that are producing the same level of output, but happen to be excreting a lot less methane. Those are the animals we want to be generating the next uh, generation of animals from. For that, we're going to need to have more data and more genotyping. Next slide, please. 
So just to summarize, I mean, look, we, we are accelerating uh, ge genetic gain uh, and we need to continue to do so. There's a good story uh, already has happened. We're on a very good track. We do need to be implementing some enhancements. Like I mentioned, the age at finishing, the methane traits, the DNA calf registration to get more genotyping. We are working closely with Chagas, Borbia, Glanbia and other stakeholders in terms of enhanced herd and, and animal carbon footprint models and using the ICBF database to generate those. You know, we ha do have accelerated breeding initiatives with, with processing government uh, industry and, and, and farmers, and we're supporting stakeholders with their data and database needs in, in, in this place. So look, there's a lot of good things happening. There's a lot of progress uh, to be made, and I'm confident that the targets that are being set, that we're, we're well on the way to making good progress in achieving those. So with that, I'd, I'd perhaps uh, like to hand over to Yoris. Yoris, if you're ready to come in there. Yeah, Sean. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So I'll, I'll go through a few items of, of, I suppose, fertility in cattle because all this talk about increasing the EBI and, and, and improving efficiency and all of that really only comes into effect, obviously, when you're dealing with pregnant animals. So they need to become pregnant first. And obviously, better EBI improves the fertility of the herd, but you need to start somewhere. And Putting theory into practice, I suppose Sean mentioned the use of the information available on ICBF through Herd Plus, etc. What's up on, on the screen now are actually two um, very standard ICBF fertility reports for two herds, Herd A and Herd B. And these herds are by no means perfect, um, but they are relatively similar, especially when you look at their metrics uh, for the cows. So both herds have a relatively similar performance from a fertility point of view when it comes to submission rate, conception rate, and pregnancy rate for the cows. But the difference between these two herds is really in their heifers. And you can see that herd A has a decent, if not good, performance in the heifer fertility, whereas herd B is really lagging behind in all the metrics. And knowing these two herds, the issue in herd B was that these heifers were not ready at the start of the breeding season. These heifers did not reach puberty in time to be ready. And so what you see here is that the overall pregnancy rate, for example, in herd B for the heifers was only 78%. So this contributes a great deal to the figure that Sean called out about the 30% of heifers not calving at around 24 months of age for the first time, but actually calving later at around 30 months. And this is a very typical figure that you would see in herds where that is an issue. Next slide, please, James. So what does that really mean then from a heifer management point of view? It really starts at day one for heifers. So heifer rearing is already important uh, and uh, in getting heifers up to that uh, right weight for, for breeding uh, and have puberty happening at the right time. So really the calving event itself is already important. And then obviously the cluster management of these heifers. So the, 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 the one, two, three rule, first milking uh, within two hours and three liters of, of good quality colostrum going into each heifer is important to set them off on, on, on the right track. And that will help you prevent the issues such as calf scour and calf pneumonia. And I suppose there's there's other pieces to it and hygiene and, and, and vaccination and so on. But if you think about um, a, a heifer that has a, a relatively severe episode of calf pneumonia, as a cow, she will actually have a 12% longer uh, calving interval. So she's already gone in calf, she's calved once, and now to go in calf a second time, if that cow had severe pneumonia as a calf, she'll actually take 12% longer uh, than a cow that didn't have pneumonia as a calf. So that's a very clear sign that what happens to calves has a huge impact on cows. On another level, a, a calf that goes through a severe episode of calf scour will ha actually have significantly lower milk production as a cow. So this is not fertility, but it's still aimed at efficiency of that animal because of uh, an event that happened to that animal as, as a calf. And obviously parasite control fits into that with um, uh, parasite, uh, proper parasite control, promoting good growth of the animals, obviously. So you can see in the table there, sort of what, what most of the heifer rearing programs would have as weight targets. And you can see that for a Holstein Friesian calf, for example, around the 13 months, the weight target is 330 kilograms. And that's when you would expect uh, heifers to start uh, showing signs of puberty, so signs of, of bullying and heat. And from experience, I know heifers that don't hit those weight targets they will not show any activity in their ovaries. They will not show any signs of bullying and therefore they are delayed in going in calf. So 
I mean, Sean already touched on it, the, 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 the heifer age at first calving of around the 24 months, the 22 to 26 months is really the target area. And purely from a calculation on, on what that would cost in lost milk production, if you have 10 heifers in your herd that are not calving at 24 months of age, but actually are calving at 30 months of age, purely based on the days that they are non-productive and based on the heifer production of your herd, you would lose somewhere in the in in the area of twenty seven thousand liters of milk production, which at 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 an average milk price actually comes down to nine thousand and a half euro that you've lost. Next slide, please, uh, James. If we then look at cow management and and to improve fertility, it's really about three areas. One is the transition cow management. So transition cow is really late dry period and early lactation. That's the transition uh, time for a cow. So transition cow management is when cows are at their most delicate. And often you will find that metabolic disorders, things such as retained fetal membranes, LDAs, milk fever, ketosis and early lactation, that's when that hits the cows the hardest. And two aspects that are really important in helping those cows through that transition period is, first of all, knowing your dry cow mineral status and supplementing where necessary and then also calving cow body condition score so not letting cows get over conditioned during the dry period is sometimes a bit tricky but having cows under conditioned is actually worse from their fertility point of view and the graph with the green bars for example shows you and this is from data from 10 years worth of monitoring herds uh, and thousands and thousands of cattle that, that, that i've done is cows with a body condition score at calving below three have a much lower uh, fertility, much lower pregnancy rate in the in the next breeding season. And it actually, it, it looks there as if it's, you know, maybe 10%. But if you look at that, actually, the likelihood of going in calf is one and a half times higher for cows in a body condition score at calving of 3 to 3.25 compared to cows that have a body condition score below 3. After the transition uh, period, you go into the pre-breeding phase of cows. And there's a few aspects there that are important, such as body condition again. But in, in this phase, we're really looking at preventing body condition loss. So the blue bars in the graph actually show that. And a, a cow that loses less than half a body condition score is much more likely to go in calf than cows that lose half a body condition score. Um, lameness is very important, obviously. Um, cows that are lame during the breeding season they're delayed in going in calf. So on average, we would see that cows that are lame take 10 days longer to conceive compared to cows that are not lame. Or if you want to see, see that differently um, or in different figures, cows that are lame during the breeding season are only 66% as likely to go in calf compared to their non-lame cows in that breeding season. And one important aspect of the pre-breeding time is your pre-breeding heat detection to identify not seen bullying animals so you can take action and correct that situation before the breeding season actually starts. And all of that is really there to say, well, can we get these animals ready for breeding when they are 42 days in milk? Because if you can achieve that, you really bring down the calving interval uh, for your cows and you have a much more uh, efficient breeding. And then the final aspect, obviously, of, of, of the fertility is overall animal health and there's a few infectious diseases that we can control through biosecurity measures and vaccination, for example. And you can see there the cost of those diseases in the herd if they if they come in. The, the cost is obviously not only due to fertility, but the, the loss in fertility has a huge part to play. That's it for me. OK, uh, OK, thanks to both yours. Um, Okay, thank you to both Yaris and Sean for, for two very comprehensive presentations addressing both herd health and herd breeding. I think what we're, what we're hearing from, from Yaris um, is the focus on herd health right across from starting off heifer right through cow and, her, uh, uh, um, and then the EBI journey and the parts of that from Sean. I think you are sending in your questions, you're sending them into 086. 1803947 and you're also emailing them in uh, to hello at landbeaconnect.com so please do continue uh, over the next couple of minutes. I think maybe yours just maybe to pick up a question with you. Um, it's a specific question around synchronization and it's asking the question here is being asked is is synchronization not the best way to improve fertility of the herd and is there a program you'd recommend? Can you speak to that for a minute yours thanks? Sure um, it's it's 
it's a good question because as such, synchronization doesn't improve the fertility of the herd. The fertility of the herd is there or, or it isn't. What you can achieve with a synchronization protocol is um, artificially bring your calving interval down a bit because you're 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 trying to get these cows um, in calf a bit quicker than if it was left to your own method of heat detection and maybe their natural cycling. Now keep in mind that from an animal welfare point of view, synchronization protocols, especially the the more long duration ones with with uh, several courses of, of of injections and so on are frowned upon a bit internationally. So we have to be a little bit careful with our synchronization protocols, but certainly for the heifers, there is some simple um, prostaglandin based uh, synchronization protocols that actually allow you to get your heifers um, all in calf very early in the, in the breeding season, which then helps these heifers to be the first calving animals in the herd and gives them that little bit of extra time in their first lactation to prepare for the, for the next breeding season, which heifers really benefit from. So overall, I would say if your cows are actually well managed in that transition period and in the pre-breeding phase, there should not be any need for synchronization protocols because they should be ready at the start of the breeding season. Okay. Um, so, Sean, I'm going to put two questions to you. I'm just conscious of, of, of time here. The first question is saying, look, thanks for that uh, the slide there um, around the EBI at, at, at various levels, but there's a and, and an awareness around how, how improved EBI is improving farm level profitability as well as reducing carbon footprint. But the question is, what's the quickest way to get from the average to the top 20% in terms of improving EBI? Now that's the first question. The second question comes um, is asking when the results from bull calves come back, is it possible for the farmer to get them at the same time as the AI companies? So, so two different but specific questions there you might address, Sean. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. I mean, I, I think the 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 the, the aspect there in relation to the. Uh, the the, how, how, the quickest way to get from the average to the top look you know the, the quickest way is probably you know to buy some of the very top ebi replacement heifers that is probably the the, the absolute quickest way um you can make that jump very very uh, quickly and 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 some herds uh, have done that um you know i mean people do have per, perhaps some concerns around the 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 biosecurity aspects of that and 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 you know they're well founded but look you know all of these things are are, are you know there there's there's trade offs in terms of risk and, and and reward i mean the the other thing obviously is to is to make sure that you you have your 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 cows genotype and then using the absolute highest uh, ebi uh, bulls uh, you know a range of bulls at at the highest ebi using those across your best cows and making sure that you're bringing forward the very best uh uh, genetic merit heifers in as as replacements, you know, and that, that so that they, they would be the the two main ones um, that I would um, that that I would I would I would suggest uh, Thomas on on the second question in terms of 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 look we're working hard all the time. I mean there is a coordination exercise there in terms of the the breeding program and trying to make sure that we we reduce the time frame first of all in terms of we're acutely conscious that that you know especially in the springtime farmers are keen to 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 get bull calves off the farm and they do want to know what the results are in terms of the EBI results for those bull calves. Um, so we are trying to minimize the first of all the, the turnaround times in terms of those coming back and also in terms of then of making sure that we get those results into the farmers hands as quickly as possible so that they can make decisions if the if the AI companies are not going to pick up those calves. OK, question here. What can genetics do to help reduce emissions, Sean? Well, I, I think that there's that, you know, we, we've seen there. I mean, the 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 from a carbon footprint point of view, and you mentioned, you know, Landvia's, uh, you know, uh, progress in terms of reducing uh, the carbon footprint per litre of milk by 30 percent by, by 2030. You know, we, we know we know that there is a, a very strong correlation, uh, you know, in terms of our, our carbon efficiency with EBI as if we were to have a, a key carbon index. I mean, and, and that's driven by, you know, Good milk solids and 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 highly fertile animals. You know, getting that six week calving rate as close to to eighty percent as 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 possible. You know, um, and we can see there on 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 the, the slide that I showed there that the top twenty percent are up at seventy nine percent six week calving rate, and that's a very very uh, good way to actually help drive uh, the carbon efficiency. In terms then of the gross emissions, two areas that that need to be focused on. One is is uh, uh, you know both within the land beer supplier base and nationally is you know is making sure that we're providing dairy beef animals that are capable of finishing quickly. 
you know, and 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 finishing quickly, profitably for 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 the, those that are rearing them, you know, and and again, as I mentioned earlier, not necessarily finishing them quickly by adding more feed and fertilizer into the mix. That's going to be counterproductive, you know. So that's one. And the second thing, we will be launching uh, some methane uh, trade evaluations next year, and over the next couple of years, definitely you will see methane coming in to be a strong trait in the, into the EBI. And of course, the goal there is to maintain the productivity that we have while reducing the EBI uh, or reducing, excuse me, reducing the, the, the methane levels coming from, from the cows. And look, we can see there, you know, we, we're, we're confident that in the same way as we have managed to, to increase um, the, the milk traits and, and the milk solids traits while also increasing fertility, some of these uh, traits do, uh, you know, do tend to work against each other, but by, you know, it, we, it is possible to find those animals that will be highly productive and produce less methane. Sean, Sean, there's a lot of questions being asked right now around the herd and there's concerns around the climate action plan, which was published and the sectoral targets for agriculture and every other sector. Is your presentation that you presented, is that in line with the national ambition uh, when it comes to, to climate action and climate policy? I, I, I think it is 100%. I mean, you know, I, I don't not necessarily claiming for a second that all of the answers in terms of achieving all of the sectoral targets are actually included in that presentation. But there are plenty of tools there that will continue to uh, allow farmers to be productive, to be profitable and uh, make a big contribution. And I'm confident that if, one, you know, if we continue on the road we're on, adopt some of the new technologies, uh, you know, do some of the new research that will be required, that we can make a big dent on those sectoral targets uh, from, a, from a breeding perspective come 2030. Just hold on the research piece. You presented a slide there around um, a funded program that the Department of Agriculture is funding there um, and with you. How soon before the, on the farm we'll see the value of that in terms of the methane traits coming in? I mean, is that months, years? What's, what's so, so, so definitely in terms of the beef animals, I definitely see and the dairy beef animals definitely see a possibility of having, uh, you know, evaluations for, for methane next year. You know, a lot of that the work is done around uh, in, in, in an indoor scenario. There is a lot more work to be done in relation to gathering the methane uh, and the methane uh, phenotypes in 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 the grass based system you know and we're working on 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 you know there's work happening in Chagas at the moment and we're working you know with the industry there at the moment to pull together a proposition so we can fast track that research but but you know you know we do need to be getting on with that and and so i would say definitely thomas over the next 2 to 3 years you're going to see methane and getting a higher higher rating within the and those methane traits within the EBI okay conscious of time yours i have one question which is um, um, two areas to focus on when it comes to pre-breeding protocol. So two, two key areas are around pre-breeding protocol. And then finally, what's your take home message uh, um, from, from your presentation? I, I would say, Thomas, the, from the pre-breeding uh, protocol, the, the first one and probably the simplest one to do is pre-breeding heat detection and identifying those cows that are not seen bulling in the, the three weeks before the breeding season is due to start. That will still give you a chance to have a vet check out those animals to see if there's anything significantly wrong with them uh, or if they just need that little bit of extra time, but at least action can be taken uh, if need be. And I suppose from the figures, I, I would actually say um, control lameness because it has such a huge impact. If you can do anything to correct lameness before the breeding season starts, even animals that were lame at the start of, of, of lactation, they still recover and they catch up in their fertility. But if they remain lame, uh, they're, they're, they're always on the back foot um, when, when okay. it comes to fertility. Okay, gonna have to just stop you there. Question for you, Sean, last question, and then maybe a wrap up comment. Where can I find my EBI number for my herd? I think, look, it's a, it's a genuine question here. And, on the ba and, and, and then maybe when you've answered that, can you just maybe finish off maybe with your core, your, your, your wrap up message to us? So, so just there, I mean, there's there's two areas. Obviously, you know, the 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 vast majority of farmers uh, are receiving their co-op performance report on a, uh, that benchmarking report on a on a on a you know it's available online on a monthly basis, um, and and it's, it's sent out there periodically as well in 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 the post. I mean, the second area obviously is is in terms of the herd plus subscription. I think if we're if we're serious about making progress here, we do need to 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 know what the EBIs are of our individual uh, animals and the individual cows in our herd, so we can make informed decision. My take-home message, I suppose, is look, you know, from 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 our perspective. 
perspective, breeding doesn't have all the answers, but it definitely has a, a very, very significant role to play. And and uh, we have the technologies available. There's more technologies coming. Um, I think you know we're going to need all of the technologies to to pool together. No, no single piece I, I think is going to have all of the answers, but I think uh, breeding can definitely has continued to, to has played it in the past and will continue to play a very, very important role in this space. OK, um, look, I want to thank yours and Sean for the contributions. For the last few minutes, though, we're going to catch up with our supplier, Jack Kearney from Rath Cormac in County Cork in what we call uh, from the farm segment. Jack and his family are participants in Glanby Ireland Chagas Future Farm Signpost Programme. So look, let's find out what's happening on his farm right now and perhaps hear about what he's doing in terms of his own breeding strategy. Morning everyone. So we're here on Jack Carney's farm in Cork this morning and Jack is part of the Tagish Glambia uh, joint programme. So I suppose Jack, um, we just want to get maybe a quick update here of what's happening on the farm at the moment. Yeah, so cows are in full time now. Uh, we'll go a week or ten days that way. We kind of restart those and cover. Um, so we'll just cover now 556 on the farm. So we'll, we should have 700 there now for 1st of December. So that's kind of where we're at. And they're in about a week, Jack, because you will be probably that little bit heavier down here. So Yeah, even we were kind of happy enough to get as, as much as we did out of it. Yeah. Um, we kind of thought that they'd be, we'd be kind of in there at the end of November, but things kind of dried up a bit again, so we managed to get them out again for another kind of week or ten days. So, yeah. And how did you finish up, Jack, overall, as a grass growth for the year? Do you have a figure there on, yeah, on the grass growth? It wasn't a spectacular year, no, but we, we grew about 12 and a half tonne. Yeah. So we're happy with that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, we, we definitely reduced the amount of. Um, Chemical nitrogen we spread there, and no, we spread about 20 or 210 um, kg of nitrogen. So, uh, so you probably had a big focus there, Jack, on, on clover and using your slurry there. Yeah, definitely. The, 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 the slurry was the big one for us this year, no? Yeah. Um, like we're kind of not at a stage where we will be now next year to make make a bit more use of clover. Um, so it's just kind of trial plots this year, but the slurry was the big one for us this year. But for how long do you stay milking, or what's the plan with the cows? So, um, first calves are dry. Um, they'll be kind of, we'll be starting calving around the end of the, the, the 25th of January. So uh, we'll start drying the, the, the cows now, um, I suppose, it, it, towards the end of November. Yeah. And we'll be drying off maybe every week then until Christmas week kind of before. But Jack, I suppose the big thing that you've been focused on there over the years is your herd EBI. So it's something that you've put a big focus on. So maybe you want to give us a, a quick one down there on the EBI? Yeah, so um, herd EBI is 185. Mainly we kind of focus on um, fertility being number one and then maintenance and solids then will be after that thing. Um, our heifers coming in now next year are 215 and then our young staff then are 245. So, yeah, yeah it's growing in like way nicely. It's going the right way. So I suppose look at, as we all know, look every increase in EBI there is, is a help to, to economically as well, like, but also I suppose in relation to emissions, if you're, you're increasing that EBI, it's going to, it's going to help overall. Well, the benefits everywhere, like doesn't just you know that it's going to, I suppose, economically is yeah. number one the year anyway, yeah. you know, but yeah. it's overall it's, it's benefit in every way. Cows, cows are going to last longer in the herd, Jack. Yeah. 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 I suppose that's the, the, the main thing to try and, and try and basically increase the salads now for us is to mature the herd, like, and you won't yeah. do that without fertility. For the farm here, you're probably looking for a cow that's that's hardier and you can take, you know, do you do a bit of walking on the yeah, farm? Yeah, so and, like we're doing, uh, I suppose, um, this year now, like we went for a maintenance figure of above 12. Yeah. So we put no bullets below 12. Like, so it's right. kind of a, 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 a bit of a smaller cow. Yeah. Um, we've gone for that from what we've had before, like, because we are, I suppose, we dry in our, all our soil, so we do have to walk farm yeah. quite a bit, like, yeah. you know, so this cow can handle that and go back in care for so and So well, that's, that's perfect, Jack. So look, I suppose I try to thank Jack for letting us out here today and talking through everything with us. Um, and look, we'll, we'll talk to you at a later date. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So thanks very much to, to Jack and TJ. You know, it was good to get um, to to hear from Jack Carney what's happening on his farm and his focus on uh, his breeding strategy. Look, finally, to thank you for your time to take time to join this webinar and our two speakers, Sean and Yoris. Uh, will you stay tuned to glanbeaconnect.com and our Twitter handle at glanbeaconnect for the next webinar 
which is looking at the very relevant topic of soil health and soil management. This webinar uh, will be available on Glanbia Connect's YouTube channel uh, for anyone who wants to have a look back at the presentation. So look, thank you for watching and for the support of our colleagues, James Brennan, Brian Short, Nance Maxuini, uh, John Warren and Jess Kelly. Thank you and safe farming.